you know, I went from my 30s to my 40s to my 50s. I still hadn't done what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a rock star when I was in my 20s. I mean, that's what, you know, all my contemporaries, all the music that I listened to, from the Beatles to the Stones, the British Invasion bands, I mean, this was my era, and I, I loved them. And then I listened to a whole bunch of jazz artists, and that's what I wanted to do. But I was never able to just make the leap. And finally, when I entered my 60s, I mean, at a time when basically everybody I know is slowing down and retiring, I said to myself, uh, if I don't do this now, when the heck am I ever going to do it? And I just decided I'm going to jump into the deep end of the pool, period. Welcome to And Then Everything Changed, a podcast about the pivotal moments in life and decisions that define us. I'm your host, Ronit Plank. Today, my guest is Robert Miller. Welcome, Robert. Thank you, Ronit. So happy to be here. I'm happy that you're here, and I'm so excited to dive in and hear more about your story. Uh, you are a different type of guest for me because you have had sort of a change in your life later than some of my other guests. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about who you were in your early 20s and 30s and what mattered to you back then. Wow, you want to go that far back, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, when I was in my early 20s, I had just graduated from college. I was in Boston, and I was a broadcasting and film major. So mm -hmm. what I really wanted to do was to go into television. And at that time, I was fortunate enough to get a job in a public television station in Boston, WGBH, mm -hmm. which is one of the, the biggies in the yes. public television uh, network. But the, that was the good part. Mm -hmm. The negative part is that the only way I could get into the station, even though I had a degree in broadcasting, was through the mailroom. Ah. So here I was in the mailroom, sorting mail, delivering mail, doing all those kinds of things, waiting for my big break to kind of get up into the production end of things, which is where I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I was playing music because music has always been my passion. And mm -hmm. I really thought that that was what I was going to do with my life was music. So I was doing the mailroom during the day and I was playing music in Boston at night. And I think between the two jobs, I was making about $100 a week. So oh, it wow. wasn't exactly yeah. a way to make a living. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and the other thing that happened was at that time, which this was the early 70s, and there was this big problem with inflation at the time. Mm -hmm. And the end result was that they weren't promoting people in businesses and, and in the station the way that I thought that they were going to do. So and when I went into the mailroom, I thought it was going to be a month or two. I'd be in the mailroom. Then I'd go back you know, up the line. Mm -hmm. And it, that didn't happen. And one mm. month turned into two. And I was in the mailroom for a year. And well, I that's interesting so because sometimes, you know, when you read stories from the older, like the older eras, it seems like this kind of thing did happen. I mean, had you seen other people or heard stories of other people advancing more quickly from these like mailroom to bigger position stories? Oh, sure. In fact, the, the guy that I started with, he mm -hmm. was there a couple of months ahead of me and he was able to get out, you know, let's say within, within about six months. So I kind of figured, all right took him six months it's it's not anybody's fault it's just you know the era mm -hmm. so i figured another month whatever and it just mm -hmm. didn't happen they, they, mm -hmm. there were just no jobs i was volunteering like crazy but ah. that's not what i wanted to do did you want to be broadcasting did you want to be on mic and reporting or did you want to be like a dj what were your main interests well in college i was a dj mm -hmm. but for this station, because they're part of the public broadcasting station, they used to produce, among other things, the, the show Zoom for kids. Mm -hmm. And they also produced the introductions and the exits for Masterpiece Theater. Oh, which wow. Which was a very big show on, on, on PBS. Yeah. And so, you know, among other things, I wanted to just go into that area, the production area. You know, it would be very cool to work the cameras and be a producer and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, as I said, I, I was stuck in the mailroom. Mm -hmm. um, and at, the, at just at that time, I had a friend of mine who was in law school. And he said to me, well, why don't you go to law school? 
And, and I said, well, why? Why would I want to do that? <laughs> and I was playing with a guy at that moment. The, the band leader who I was playing with was a doctor from oh. South Africa. Mm -hmm. And he did medicine during the day, and he played jazz and music at night. So my friend said to me, well, you could be like Stanley. You, you, could, you could do law during the day, and you could play music at night. And uh, just to show how stupid I was, I thought about it for about one nanosecond. And I said, oh, that sounds great. You know, sure. <laughs> Wait, so this is fun. I mean, it's not funny, but it's kind of, it's really, you know, it's, it's like this thing about time passing and perspective. If you could go back now, I mean, would you have said no? Of course I would have. I was an idiot. I mean, I, I didn't even think about it. It's not like a traditionally reckless decision, right? But No, he, it, it he, actually, I, I, I was joking a moment ago. I, it, <laughs> it turned out to be, you know, part of my career path, so to speak. Yeah. I, I wound up going to law school. Uh -huh. And unfortunately, I wound up doing well in law school. So when I got <laughs> out, I got myself a, a decent paying job, and I still said to myself, okay, I'm going to do this during the day, I'm going to play music at night, mm -hmm. and guess what? That was, it just didn't happen. Okay. Now, where, where was your, fa I'm curious, like, where are you in the birth order if you have siblings, and what were your parents' impressions, and like, the people who knew you the best, what did they think about what you were doing? Well, I think they thought I was finally on the right path because they didn't <laughs> think I could make a living, you know, in music. Uh -huh. And uh, so they, they were proud of me, you know, this is what, what I was doing. But And they also knew that my goal was really to continue to play music. But like I said, I got sidetracked. Uh -huh. And the next thing I knew, and you're not going to believe it, but it's true, I stopped playing music for 15 years. Wow, but... Tell me more about that. And by the way, when you say play music, you know, I don't play an instrument. I used to sing. But what do you play? Well, I, my main instrument is the bass, the electric mm -hmm. bass. Mm -hmm. And again, I had this vision that I was going to do law during the day, play music at night. But, you know, once you get into a law firm and you're a young associate in the law firm, they, they work you, you know, like crazy. Yes, yes. And so when was I going to play music? At 2 in the morning? I mean, that's... that's and did you, have a, did you have a family yet of your own? Well, I was married. Mm -hmm. and, um, what did your wife think about your decision? And how did she, how did she reflect back to you this, this change in your time to play music? You know, I've been really, really fortunate. My wife was my girlfriend in college. I mean, that's mm -hmm. how long ago we met. And she has seen me go through a whole bunch of different career changes, and she's always been supportive. So it worked out. But the problem is that, you know, when you set yourself a, a dream, a goal like I had, sometimes life gets in the way, and that's what happened to me. So I, I had a, jo a new job. I was married. Soon I had a couple of kids. I had a mortgage. And the idea mm -hmm. that I was going to somehow go back and do what I had set out to do in music became almost like a fantasy. Mm -hmm. So, again, I, was, I stopped playing professionally for 15 years, and I was miserable as a well, result Well, I was just going to ask that. I mean, you know, these decisions, like, uh, it, it, am I right that you didn't wake up and say, I am no longer playing music? It just sort of happened that you went less and less, and then before you knew it, you just weren't? That's exactly right. You know, it's like one year turned into two, into yeah. three, into five, and you and you turn around and you say, "Wait a minute, this this wasn't the plan. W what happened?" So no, I'm I curious. Like, I, I want to, you know, I I'm gonna I want to roll around in this moment just a little bit more because <laughs> I I know you're like you want me to wallow in this. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, I didn't use that word. I used a clumsier <laughs> expression. But what I mean is like I think it's really interesting because these things happen to us and we often don't understand them until later. Yeah, and like I'm just curious, like. Did your wife, and I hear that she is supportive and amazing and you have one of those love stories, did she notice that you seemed down or did you, did people who loved you or even your bandmates say, hey, you know, why didn't you come out? Like, what was your response to those, those feelings around you? Well, you know, like you said before, when you're in the midst of something, you almost don't think about it. Mm. Because I didn't have any possibility of going down a different path at that moment. Mm -hmm. Too many things going on, too many obligations going on. And I just kind of went with it. But 
it was eating at me all right i was going to say like when you thought about music did you have like when okay so here's another thing because i'm a writer and you know fellow writers coming up trying to make it so and i used to act and so i kind of understand the journey of someone who's not doing the conventional path but did you have friends who were making strides uh, around you and did that affect you at all like how what did you think about when you thought about music was it wistful or were you angry had you shut the door it was both. And you're mm. 100% right. One of the people I played with when I was in Boston was a drummer named Anton Figg. Anton oh. Figg went on to, pl- to be the drummer on the David Letterman show for, I don't know, 20 years or so. Mm. So here right. we were, you know, more or less um, equals mm-hmm. playing uh, in the early 70s in Boston. And he stayed with it. He's an amazing drummer. And mm-hmm. he's become one of the world class drummers. And had that gig for so long and of course I was wistful about it and I said gee that may have been could have been me doing something like that Mm -hmm. but you know I took a different path and that's just the way it was Mm -hmm. the real issue for me was what was I going to do about it and finally after as I said about 15 years I got lucky how did I get lucky there was a place I was living in New York City and mm-hmm. there was a place that I just happened to hear about that was like a dating service for musicians. I don't mean <laughs> literally, you know, dating <laughs> men and women. Like It wasn't like date a musician. That's not what you mean. What I meant was it was <laughs> I know, a I'm place joking. where you could go there as a musician and you could say to them, I'd like to play uh, Led Zeppelin's third album, The Second Side, okay? And they would mm-hmm. find three other idiots that would want to play that music with you. <laughs> And so I went down to this place. It was called the Off Wall Street Jam. Mm-hmm. And it was just, it was a bunch of amateur musicians, but we all, ha- you know, loved music for one reason or another. And I started going there and playing again. Mm-hmm. And that kind of resuscitated everything inside of me. Not only my playing improved, it was so rusty, but my desire to play increased tremendously. Mm-hmm. And it was at that point that I began to accelerate my career in music. It wasn't Mm -hmm. where I wanted it to be, but it was much better than where it had been. So I I met somebody who introduced me to a guy that owned the recording studio in New York City. It turns out the guy that owned the studio grew up on the same block as I did. Oh, wow. And we were friends from when we were young. So I knew him well. Mm -hmm. And you know, I talked to him and I and he said to me, why don't you come in? Let's do an album. So my first album was the Robert Miller Group, and I did it mm-hmm. in 1994. Mm-hmm. And um, you know what? I was very proud of the, of the way it came out. I had written one or two songs for it. Others were kind of cover songs, if you will. Mm-hmm. I was mainly playing a, f- a form of contemporary jazz at that time. And... After that, I said, great, I'm kind of now back in it, but I still had all my my legal career going on. And, you know, I I tried to play where I could with the band. I I put a band together of guys that had played on the the record with me. Mm -hmm. And for a couple of years, we, you know, off and on would play at some pretty nice places like um, the Blue Note in New York, which is a real major club. We played at a few festivals as well. And uh, but it, it was it was more like an avocation. It was more like a hobby because I couldn't do it full time. Mm-hmm. And so it's it, although it it helped me um, in my quest, it, it didn't resolve things for me. That wasn't really where I was trying to get to. Mm-hmm. And, and how was your law career going at this point? How was and how many kids did you have? And well, I have two kids that I know of. <laughs> 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 and, um, okay, and, but how, and and how is law going for you as you reinvigorated this creative spark for yourself? You know, it was going. For, it was like a parallel universe. Mm. Okay, I did. You know, it's like people compartmentalize things in life. Mm-hmm. So I had my my law thing, and I was doing that, and it was going fine. And then I I had my music thing, and I was trying desperately to increase the music side of things but you know it was very difficult because I had all these other obligations Mm -hmm. and then in the midst of all of this I had what turned out to be a a, a terrible life-threatening accident and Mm -hmm. uh, it it was in the year 2000 
I was, it was almost 20 years ago to the day. It was December mm. of uh, 2000. I, I used to ride my bicycle all over New York City. Mm -hmm. I was a big bicycle rider. And one very cold Saturday morning, I, I took off on my bicycle and I went over the 59th Street Bridge. And if your uh, listeners know about that, it goes mm -hmm. from Manhattan into Queens. Mm -hmm. And long story short, but as I came off the bridge, a car came up from behind me and smashed into my bicycle. Mm. And I, my bike and I went flying backwards over the, the van, oh. landing on the street. And I didn't know, I was knocked out. I didn't know mm. anything. I woke up with these two EMS guys hovering over me. And mm. I heard one saying to the other, boy, is this guy lucky. We usually find people like him dead or paralyzed. Wow. And I was neither at that moment. Mm. And so they ambulanced me to a trauma center and blah, blah, blah. The long story short was that I had broken my arm and my neck. <gasps> and obviously the neck was more significant. Mm -hmm. And what made it so incredible was that my, and I had eight hours of surgery a couple of days later to repair everything. Wow. And the the lucky, the phenomenally lucky part of this is that it was as if, as my doctor said, it was as if, as if my neck exploded, but none of the bone fragments touched my spinal cord. Somehow. Wow. And that so was they the only basically got between, shattered, like completely blown apart, but none yeah. of them hurt the cord. Right. Mm -hmm. Nothing went into the cord. It was, you know, otherwise I would have been paralyzed like a, a Christopher Reeve or something. Yeah. So it was just, it was so phenomenally lucky. And mm -hmm. it was a sign to me that okay, I'm, I'm here for a reason still. And it was the first of two uh, kicks in the rear, so to speak, <laughs> that put me onto the path that I'm currently on. That, the yeah, how long was your recovery? And, you know, did you ever get on a bike again? Yeah, I did. <laughs> but I promised my wife that I wouldn't ride in Manhattan so yeah did, did the person I haven't ridden in Manhattan in a long time that's good I'm glad I'm glad to hear that <laughs> um what about I just on a side note the van driver were they considered uh liable for that or was it just an accident or well, I was fortunate that the guy that hit me mm. um had absolutely no insurance whatsoever <laughs> so <laughs> there was you know I just had to dig out of my own pocket to take mm. care of things and you know mm -hmm. there were there were the the usual bills that you would expect from something like this yeah. it was a traumatic experience there's no question yeah. about it it changed everything for me but it also motivated me i was given a new lease on life do you st do you have pain at all in your neck or your arm these days no. wow no. that's great so what was your second kick in the butt the second one you mean yeah well I, after that accident, I then started to move much quicker and firmer in with my music. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I started to play more. I started to put um, bands together. I still was not doing it full time. And, but I knew that I was kind of on a trajectory that if I kept going, maybe I was going to be able to get where I wanted to. But I was getting older at the same time. You know, I went mm -hmm. from my 30s to my 40s to my 50s. I still hadn't done what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a rock star when I was in my 20s. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what, you know, all my contemporaries, all the music that I listened to, from the Beatles to the Stones, the British Invasion bands. I mean, mm -hmm. this was my era, and I, I loved them. And then I listened to a whole bunch of jazz artists, and that's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, but I, 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 w I was never able to just make the leap. And finally, when I entered my 60s, I mean, at a time when basically everybody I know is slowing down and retiring, mm -hmm. I said to myself, uh, if I don't do this now, when the heck am I ever going to do it? Mm -hmm. And I just decided I'm going to jump into the deep end of the pool, period. <laughs> and that was five years ago, about. And in five years, I mean, I've been so phenomenally fortunate as to where this has gone. I, I've got nine albums, including mm. a Billboard number one. Wow. I've got over four million video views, over a million Spotify streams, over 50,000 Facebook fans. I've played festivals and concerts around the world. And I've even opened for artists like um, Blues Traveler and wow. Edwin Winter and uh, Boney James. It, it's been 
quite a ride. <laughs> it's all because I had this dream and I finally took the steps necessary to execute on this dream. Mm. And so I've become a big, big proponent of people kind of getting in touch with themselves and their dreams. We all have dreams. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think we all start off, particularly when we're teenagers, and we probably have big dreams then. You know, mm -hmm. you want to be mm -hmm. a nuclear s scientist. You want to be a baseball player. You want to be a musician. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's very few kids that are teenagers that say, my dream is to become an accountant, right? <laughs> <laughs> So you, don't get nasty. <laughs> there might be someone who does, but yeah. I'm not knocking accounts. I'm just saying it's probably <laughs> not going to be their dream when they're 13 yes, years old. Yes, of course. Right? I actually talked to someone yesterday who <laughs> said to me, <laughs> she said, um, you know, you've always known what you wanted to be and do if you think back like you knew it since you were young like really right. young. And I, right. that, and it's interesting to me that you're saying something very similar today. A hundred percent. I think yeah. everybody in their gut knows that they have or had a dream. And yeah. usually, like me, dreams get, you know, they, they get waylaid. They get put aside. Uh, and and that's very natural. It's because, you know, so many other things happen in life. That some mm -hmm. you can predict and some you can't predict. The The issue is, are, are you really satisfied and happy with what you're doing? If you are, great. OK, mm -hmm. but so many people are not. Mm -hmm. So many people are dissatisfied or unhappy or they're just kind of, you know, going through the motions every day. And I believe that if you were to follow your dream and, and I'm proof positive, you can do it at any age and at any time. OK, mm -hmm. and look what I did. I went into a field, namely music, that is completely a young person's game. Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if I was able to succeed at that, just you know, most people I think can succeed at what they want to do. And dreams, remember, come in all different shapes and sizes. Uh, it can be I want to learn a new skill, I want to learn a new hobby, I want to open up a new business, I always wanted to do X, Y, or Z, I wanted to fly and travel around the world. You know, there's all different kinds of dreams. Mine yeah. happened to be music, so. Um, and I really believe at, at no point in your life, certainly not when you're older, do you ever want to look back and say, gee, I really wish I had taken the shot. Mm -hmm. I wish I had tried. Yes, I, I totally see that. And I, I wonder, you know, do you think that in a parallel universe, had you not gotten into the accident, you would not have found music again? It's very possible. It's very yeah. possible because in order to take the step that you need in order to really go for whatever your dream is, you need to be motivated. Something has to work inside of you to push you in that direction. And for me, as I said, the first indication was that accident because I felt mm -hmm. like I got a new lease on life mm -hmm. and I didn't want to blow it. Mm -hmm. You know, I know people uh, who who do s feel, have expressed that they feel locked into the life that they've built and that there are financial obligations and that they're sort of in this cycle of, if I'm gonna keep this and take care of my kids this way, I have to do this. But you know, they're, they're kind of starving inside. You know, they, they have other ideas and goals. And, and so how, how do you approach that kind of a situation? I mean, you know, the, the pragmatic part of me says, well, what about money? You know, what if, and, and again, I understand your story and I'm, I'm just being a little devil's advocate here. How, how would you approach if money is a real concern, you know, and, you know, do you feel like you jump and then the net will be there or you just have to be willing to change how you live? I mean, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I actually came up with a little acronym, if I could use that yeah, with you. Yeah, sure. Um, to kind of explain my theory on all of this. And I use the word dream in order to explain it. Mm -hmm. So the D stands for dream. You obviously have to have a dream. And as I said a moment ago, I think everybody's got a dream. And you kind of know it. You know it mm -hmm. in your gut what that dream is or was. So I don't think that's very difficult. Mm. The R in dream, to me, means is your dream realistic? So if, for example, when I was 60, I decided that I wanted to be a professional football player, that was not going to be a very <laughs> realistic dream. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, I, it could have been my dream forever to be a, a pro football player, but you know, you're not going to do it at age 60. Mm-hmm. So you need to have something that's relatively realistic. Okay, mm-hmm. E in dream is to me the most important one. It's execute. How do I execute on the dream? Okay, I've got a dream. I, I really want to take a shot. What do I do? And I think it comes down to having an action plan, which mm-hmm. is really, I think, what you need for almost anything in life. You want to do something. You want to go somewhere. You want to you know, achieve something. Have a little plan. What's the plan? Well, it's usually baby steps. Mm-hmm. How do I take that first step? What is it that I need to do? What's my second step? What, what are the things that I need to do in order to achieve the goal that I want? So that, that's, that to me is a very important part of the whole thing. Mm-hmm. The A in dream for me is adjust, meaning there's no dream, there's no path that is a straight path. I mean, certainly for me, it was one step forward, two steps back, three steps mm-hmm. sideways. That's the way life goes. And you have mm-hmm. to be willing to deal with that. You know, I, I love this little quote from, if you remember, Mike Tyson, the heavyweight champion. Mm. Mm-hmm. And they asked him once when he was going into a fight, did he have a plan going into the fight? Mm-hmm. He said, yeah, everybody's got a plan until you get hit in the face. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard that before. I like it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you just have to be able to adjust. And certainly, in you know, I make it seem like uh, my, my music dream w- was a straight shot and everything worked out great. It, it was far from it. Okay, Mm -hmm. far from I played any number of times before, you know, uh, empty houses with just the waitress and the bartender (laughs) and and, and us. Mm -hmm. So you just have to be able to deal with stuff like that. So you need to adjust. Mm -hmm. And then the M goes to, in my mind, what is your measurement of success? Mm. Every dream is different and every dream will have different measurements of success in music it, it, it's kind of obvious you know where are you playing have you sold albums have you made mm-hmm. records etc but every dream as I say has a different measurement and it's good for two things one it, it keeps you on the path it tells you how are you doing mm-hmm. and secondly not every dream is meant or is going to succeed I mean mm-hmm. let's face it mm-hmm. And again, to me, the issue is not, did I become a raging success at what I set out to do? It's first and foremost, did I take the shot? Mm -hmm. And I believe that you can have an incredible joy and happiness just knowing that you tried, Mm -hmm. even if it doesn't work out quite the way that you thought it was going to work out or hoped it would work out. And of Mm -hmm. course, if it does work out, then, you know, so much the better. Mm-hmm. I agree. I, I think uh, when I think about regret, I, I think that regret is one of the worst feelings uh, that someone can have. Right. Yeah. Why would you want to look back? We only have one life. We're only going around once. And, you know, it, I really believe that uh, most people just never take the, the step that we're talking about. In mm-hmm. fact, if you go back, what is it, a couple of hundred years, you remember... Uh, Henry David Thoreau, the philosopher, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he had this great quote that I love. He said, the great mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, it's true. It's true then. It was true then. It's true today. Most people are not terribly happy with their lives, you know, Mm -hmm. and it could be for any number of reasons. They're overweight. They're, you know, they're, they have illness or whatever, Mm -hmm. or they just didn't do what they thought they were going to do. They just didn't try what they hoped that they were going to be able to try Mm -hmm. so this is one way that i think you can you can make up for that so i'm a big believer in in dreams yeah do you uh do you talk to your children i mean i know they're grown now but do you does this figure in your conversations with close people close to you about you know if they come to you and they say they're not doing so great or they're they're just you know maybe dragging a little bit do you kind of employ some of this not not like as an evangelist but just like a check-in like what would make you happy you know are you doing what you want to do yes i i try to do that and Mm -hmm. i do it even more now Mm -hmm. i I am probably starting a podcast myself Ah. um, in the near future because and i think i'm going to call it follow your dream yeah because i do think that this idea of kind of uh, dream therapy Mm -hmm. 
I, maybe therapy is the wrong word, but you know, a dream status, a, a dream path, mm-hmm. is so important. And particularly, you know, look, we're in a terrible time in the world. Mm. This pandemic is still raging. Um, we we just finished. Uh, you know, an, an administration that so many people were happy mm-hmm. is over with. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of negativity out there. And I believe that, again, the idea of following your dream is a way that we can inject, you know, happiness and joy back into our lives. And mm-hmm. isn't that what it's all about? Yes, and also to an extent that is something that we can control. I mean, we can't always control, like you said, you're not going to get everything you want. But you know, we can control what we set our sights on and we can control on the work we need to do to get to those steps. We can't, you know, we can't promise that we're going to book every gig or get everything published that we want, but we can control how we dream and where we focus. And I think that alone is so empowering. Yes. Taking control of your life. Mm -hmm. A lot of us, we just slide through life. And Mm -hmm. it's, again, it's a very natural kind of human situation. Most mm-hmm. people don't even think about this stuff. They they get up day to day. They're they're doing their routine. They're going about it. You know, do they even think about? Well, am I happy? Is mm-hmm. this really what I want to do? I think some people do, and, and they're probably the ones that see psychologists and <laughs> psychiatrists. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of us just you know we just kind of go through life, and then again you wake up, or you come to a realization maybe a year later, ten years later, thirty years later. You know, remember that song, Is That All There Is? Yes, you know, yes. Peggy, Peggy <laughs> Lee's song? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And as you get older, th- those types of thoughts come into your head more because, mm-hmm. you know, you, 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 you're you looking back um, and, and you're seeing, how did it go? Is this what I wanted to do? Is this where I wanted to be? Mm-hmm. These are natural instincts, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Well, so what are you most excited about project-wise <laughs> right now? I Are you laughing at me? <laughs> uh, I, I put an album together over the summer, mm-hmm. which was very, very different for, for me and for my band. My band, mm-hmm. by the way, is called Project Grand Slam. Mm-hmm. And I, I put that band together a number of years ago, and I reformed the band uh, about five years ago when I really went into this thing full time and mm-hmm. jumped in the deep end of the pool. I surrounded myself with a group of young extremely talented, mainly foreign-born musicians. And I was able to extract their youth and vitality and vibrancy as part of my music. So it's been a wonderful experience for me to do that. Mm -hmm. And um, as I said, we've done nine albums in total. Wow. But all these albums, I usually would would record by rehearsing um, very, very uh, detailed uh, in advance. Then we'd go into the studio. We'd record the entire album in usually a day. Mm. Okay, we we mm-hmm. would do maybe two, three takes of each song. Then we'd do some some uh, fix ups afterwards. But that's kind of the old school way of of making a record, an album. Mm. But over the summer, you couldn't do that. Yeah. Okay. During the pandemic, that was out. We couldn't rehearse together. We couldn't record together. So what did I do? Two things. Number one, I said we had we had fortunately had just finished recording an album about a week or two before the the world shut down. Mm. It's called East Side Sessions, mm-hmm. and I took four of the songs on that album and I said let's make some videos. So we did two videos that I call um, Zoom videos. You know where you've got each person you know in a little box you know, <laughs> on the screen and we're all lip syncing and lip playing to the music and it it came out great but Mm -hmm. then we got more creative the the third one we did it was an animated video and the fourth one was kind of a spaghetti western kind of video (laughs) and in total they they all went over great they probably had about a million views for for all four of them so i was very proud of that wow and and then i said you know i i like i write music that's what i do and i was writing all this music and i said i'm going to start recording it but i had no home studio to record it in Mm -hmm. so i called up my engineer and and i said what should i do i I can't come into your your studio it's it's just not safe at this time and i started to record the new album literally on my iphone okay Mm -hmm. how crazy is that yeah um i'm waiting for apple to call me that should you put me in a commercial or something but (laughs) I, i recorded on my iphone i sent the i emailed the stuff to my engineer he kind of 
brought it up to uh, standards. And then I would send out emails to my different bandmates and, you know, I'd say to the guitar player, okay, would you fly in a guitar part for this? Mm -hmm. The keyboard players would do that. And so we put together the album on a track-by-track track kind of basis. And the other thing that happened with the album, which is called Summer of Love 2020, and I'll tell mm -hmm. you why in a second, I always have had a female lead singer in the band. And it's one of the hallmarks of... Project Grand Slam, and I've had some great, great singers. But as we were recording this album, I said, you know, these songs are so personal. They're all about the pandemic. They're all about my feeling that love is what's going to get us through this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I said, I think I got to sing these songs myself. So I stepped up mm -hmm. and I took the shot. This is another, you know, this was always a dream of mine to be the front person, if you will, singing mm -hmm. these things. And I recorded the album and put it out for you know the pre-release reviews and i'm i was so happy because the reviews came back just spectacular oh wow I mean, they called it magnificent and five stars and this that and the other thing so that album summer of love 2020 is going to be released at the end of january mm -hmm. um january 29th um, like i said the reviews have been spectacular and uh, I would love to have people, you know, take a listen to it. The easiest way is to go to our store. It's called thepgsstore.com. Mm -hmm. And I have a special gift for the people in your audience. Oh. And that is if they go to the store, I've got a copy of the album East Side Sessions that I will give to everyone for free. All they wow. need to do is uh, click on that album. And at the uh, when they go to pay, just enter the code DREAM, D-R-E-A-M, and they get the album for free. It's a, a nice way wow. to introduce them to our, our music and to do something nice for your, for your audience. Thank you so much, Robert. My That's, pleasure. And, yeah, of course, awesome. they can listen to other things like <laughs> Summer of Love. And, you know, mm -hmm. as usual, you have a lot of stuff in the store. But I'm more interested in just kind of spreading spreading the love, shall we say. Mm -hmm. That's really great. Thank you so much. I love I love that. That's really very excellent. I'm glad I can offer that and that you're doing that. Is, is that also the best place to find you if people want to connect with you or follow what's going on? If they want to connect with me, I'll give them uh, two email addresses. One mm -hmm. is um, Robert at Project Grand Slam dot com, and mm -hmm. I'll be happy to respond to anybody. And then, like I said, I'm I'm planning this podcast, so oh, yeah. they can also write to me at Follow Your Dream to Success at Gmail dot com. Oh, that's great. Okay, good. And are you on any social media at all? I'm on every social media note to man. <laughs> uh -huh. And it, would it be under Project Grand Slam or Robert yes, Miller? Yes, it's all under Project Grand Slam. But we have a, we're very active on Facebook. Okay, you great. Facebook and at the Project Grand Slam. We're oh, good. We're active on Instagram, active on YouTube. So when this comes out, I'm going to send this all around the world for you. Great. Great. Well, this has been a just a great conversation and such a good way to start the new year. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story with me and for taking some time today to talk about how you found your dreams. Thank you. I, I really appreciate being on the show, Ronit, and uh, you've got a terrific show here, and I hope the audience continues to grow. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to And Then Everything Changed. For more on this episode, photos, and other episodes you might like, please visit atecpodcast.com. You can connect with me and learn more about episodes on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram also. Just search for my name, Ronit Plank, R-O-N-I-T-P-L-A-N-K, and you will find all the updates. If you like this podcast, please remember to subscribe and also rate and review so other people can find it. Thank you so much for listening. 